okay. Um, all right, folks. So, shall we get started? <laughs> okay. Um, good. Um, so, I suggest we're going to get started with uh, this multi center initiative. Um, a few few disclaimers, I should say, at the beginning. So, uh, or important notes. For one is, we are on the internet. Hello, who, anyone who might be listening or watching. Uh, so, you know. Um, and uh, there will be lots of discussions, hopefully. That's intended, okay? Um, so, but if you do make a comment, uh, which, which I hope you will, use the microphone because otherwise, anyone who is tuning in uh, f on the from the World Wide Web will not be hearing you, okay? So, we're going to use the microphone for for the discussions. The other thing I should say is that uh, we've been doing a little bit of preparation. We have had meetings and tried to. Uh, prepare for this event, and it was a little bit of a challenge because, for the one side, we want to keep this open, right, and really want to get as much as possible comments and uh, make it make it uh, uh, unstructured, if you will. On the other hand, we wanted to provide a structure so that the discussions don't go anywhere, and then you know the, the whole thing fizzles out. So um, it uh, was a challenge for us to come up with something where we keep this, the, 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 where we can keep a good trade-off between broadness of discussion at the same time structured discussions. And obviously, uh, we don't know where this whole thing will be going, so we need to be flexible, okay? Um, so what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna give a brief introduction for those of you who have not been in Cambridge. So actually, that's a good question. Who has been at the paper, at the Pepper a workshop in, in, in Cambridge on brain stimulation. Okay, so there's, there's, there's quite a few uh, of you who have been there. So that's where this whole thing started out, okay? So it was a conference like this, um, organized by Benedict, actually, and Matt Davis. Um, and that's, that's where this started. Um, so these are the people. Uh, on the multi-center steering committee, however you want to call it, who volunteered. Uh, it's in alphabetical order, right? So, um, okay. Um, so, as I said, uh, we met at the conference in, in, in Cambridge and uh, lots of uh, uh, fantastic TSES studies were, were presented. Um, however, we also uh, figured out that we need to acknowledge that there is an issue about the robustness of the effects, right? So um, some effects uh, are replicated, others aren't replicated, and so the, there is an issue here, okay? And we need to address this issue as a field or so that was uh, the, the, the conclusion uh, sort of, 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 of the discussions. And uh, indeed, uh, all of us probably know uh, this paper it has been referred to uh, several times already uh, uh, today. Uh, where, where they end their paper literally by saying, more generally, our result challenges the common assumption that TSCS entrains and enhances uh, uh, endogenous rhythms. Thus, future study will have the burden of proof when such claims are made. So um, I think that uh, there was the motivation for this multi center initiative to try and come up with uh, a, a, a paradigm, a study that we can run in many, many labs, get the large N, and then uh, figure out whether TSES actually does work, whatever work means here, okay? So that's something we would also have to define. Um, so the scientific uh, question uh, that, 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 that also has been changed from what we've put out in the document uh, um, and m m might also change throughout the discussion. But for now, the scientific question that we agreed on um, was, are there effects of low-intensity TACS in humans 
that can only be explained by phasic changes of the current, importantly, excluding indirect effects through peripheral stimulation. So that was something that we could agree on, that that is a good question and a tangible uh, question uh, uh, to address. And uh, if we do find such effects, what is the uh, effect size? So how many participants do we need to, to reveal this effect in a chosen paradigm? And there are, of course, uh, many outcomes right, from such an initiative um, um, uh, or in terms of the results. One is a phasic outcome such that the phase of TACS correlates with behavior, so there could be something that you are more likely to detect the target at the trough of the TACS phase than at the peak of the TACS phase, or, some, or that, something like that, right? Um, the possible outcome could also be a frequency effect, such that when we change the frequency, the internal frequency, when we speed it up, we slow it down, that we do something to behavior. Uh, another possible outcome could be a tonic effect, such that stimulation in general uh, impairs or uh, facilitates uh, behaviors. And of course, there's also the possibility that we don't find effects, okay? So these are the things that, 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 that we came up with, which, which uh, could be possible uh, results that we're gonna get. And uh, there, there are uh, two main aims, aims of this whole initiative, and I think uh, for, for probably today and also tomorrow, I guess, uh, we're going to be focusing on the first aim, which is identify a paradigm to answer the uh, scientific question. Um, and that's, that's the first step, right? So the first thing we need to do is to agree as a consortium on a particular paradigm. And uh, we thought we're gonna use this conference in particular because you know, there's, a not, there's a lot of knowledge in this room, right? <laughs> so we all have done uh, several TSCS studies, we all have our unique expertise, and uh, we hope that by uh, tapping into the, 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 the each, each one's unique expertise that we came up with a synergistic, uh, synergistically created paradigm, okay? which in theory should be very efficient because you know, um, we, we, we do have, have a lot of knowledge to, to, uh, to use here. Um, okay, the second aim is once we've uh, 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 figured out a paradigm that the majority of or everyone uh, uh, being part of this initiative is willing to buy into, then we can collect data, right, in the same paradigm uh, in multiple sites and then uh, see how the effects uh, replicate, how robust the effect is and get the true uh, estimate of the effect size because we're gonna have a very large N, okay? So, so these are the two main aims. And I think when we, when we uh, discuss then later on the initiative, I think it is probably important to, to, to focus on this bit, okay? Um, yeah, possible outcomes. Obviously, uh, we need to think about what is the effect of what we are doing here. And it can have many effects. So a positive result, uh, whatever a positive result is, right? There are also issues as to how do we define a positive result in means of a significant effect, right? Or do we define it in other, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 statistical terms like Bayesian frameworks, effect sets, whatsoever. Uh, however, these issues set aside, the positive result, I think would be a big step, uh, step forward for the field because if we do it right, then we can actually safely assume the TSCS is working and we can all go back to doing our experiments, right? And then when we want to publish our stuff and, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, some inconvenient reviewer says, TSCS does not work, then we can refer them to this study and say, you know, we've we figured that out, it does work, so that's fine. There's also a possibility, of course, of a negative uh, result, uh, and then, uh, so that we, that we don't get any effects, right? That's a risk, uh, and then uh, we need to assume that TSCS, with, that's important, okay? 
that TSS with the chosen stimulation parameters, uh, uh, so with our paradigm, is ineffective. So the important bit is also that when we don't get the result, we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, but you know, we just say, okay, it doesn't work in this particular paradigm. Um, and uh, I think this could also be a process, right? So we don't have to think of this whole initiative as a one-off thing, you know, which could be a process. So we could do it uh, multiple times if, uh, if people are happy to do so. Um, yeah, such an result would be, uh, I think, remarkable nevertheless, because uh, it, it, it would have been designed by uh, people who you know, know a lot about TSES, right? So if we as a group with you know, all that knowledge design a paradigm and still don't find anything, given that we have a large N and given that the paradigm ideally has been uh, uh, um, created with, with, with lots of background knowledge, I think it would be remarkable. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, we will have a very high uh, sample size, so that means we can actually properly assess uh, the null uh, hypothesis, hopefully, dependent on how many labs will participate. So um, now let's let's focus on the first step. How do we find this this paradigm? And it's uh, obviously. Uh, obvious that this is a crucial step, okay? Um, and we've already gone through a process, so I've sent out uh, invitations for suggesting uh, paradigms uh, to many of you, anyone who is on the list. By the way, one thing I should say is we, we have a list of all the people who are willing to contribute or express their interest to be part of this. The list currently contains 40 labs. It's around the world. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you are interested, if you're not part of the list or think you're not part of the list, if you're interested, just send me an email. I will add you uh, to the list. So um, I've sent out uh, invitations to suggest paradigms, and eight, uh, well, actually, originally nine people suggested paradigms, but one paradigm was dropped because of uh, uh, um, uh, transcutaneous uh, stimulation effects. Um, so we uh, <clears throat> were left with eight paradigms uh, suggested by these uh, very uh, kind people. And um, I would like to thank all of them that they suggested their paradigm, right? Because without, without you guys suggesting paradigms, we wouldn't have not much to discuss today. Or, uh, so, so thanks to everyone who sent their suggestions, okay? Um, I've given uh, the paradigms uh, uh, acronyms. It's something you kind of get forced into when you move to the UK, the, the acronyms and stuff. So uh, each of the paradigms has their acronym. And then um, I did send out um, another uh, 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 sheet, another form to uh, uh, most of you, or uh, all of you uh, maybe, um, to rate these paradigms, okay? So we had this form, and then what we uh, uh, focused on was the uh, scientific ranking. So that was a quantitative measure we got here, right? So on a scale from zero to 10, how strong would be the, the, the evidence for the scientific uh, question? Um, and 16, well, I should say 17 returned scoring sheets, one of them was not really usable, so 16 uh, returned uh, 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 usable scoring sheets. With at le that, that's at least 40% already, you know? It's not so bad. <laughs> Could have been more. Uh, but then I should say that a lot of the scoring sheets were submitted after the deadline. So, um, uh, and these are the results for the scientific rating, right? So these are the eight, eight paradigms. Um, and uh, I, I don't want to say, you know, the, the, the best or worst paradigms, all of these are fantastic paradigms, right? Uh, but the, uh, the ones who were rated most for their scientific value uh, for this particular project was the visual detection paradigm suggested by Till Ole uh, and the double flash uh, illusion paradigm suggested by Benedikt Zöfel. 
and uh, the two paradigms which ranked uh, right, right below them were the alpha lateralization and the visual spatial uh, working memory uh, uh, paradigm. So originally I suggested that we're gonna shortlist four paradigms. However, these two received the highest ranking, so I, I told Till uh, uh, and Benedict to prepare some slides, and indeed they did. And um, just a few minutes ago, um, a student from Andrea Antal's lab, I, I'm terribly sorry, I forgot, forgot your name, um, um, also said that they prepared some slides for the visual spatial working memory paradigm. So uh, the next step would be to uh, uh, present the paradigms um, and discuss them. Yes. Yes, I would just like to make one remark. So um, I think there are different sort of um, ways we can run this. And one way is reproducing a paradigm that has already been published and that we are happy with. Or sort of creating a new paradigm we are all happy with and we think is better than everything already published. And I think some of these examples, like the double flash and the visual spat working memory that will be presented, Andreas Antal and Benedict Zerfel's presentation, these are already published. We know the effect sizes, we know how they would need to be run. And like the third one, which will be presented by Till Ole Bergman, is something new that hasn't been published yet. So I think part of the discussion will also need to be, do we want to go with something new, maybe risky, and how should we go about it, or should we go with something that has already been published? Yep. So just as a remark. That, that is something important, uh, uh, absolutely, that we uh, should consider. Um, a probably more general remark as to how do we make decisions, um, you know, as a, a, as a community. So we, we discussed also that and we thought that probably a voting procedure would be best, right? So we're gonna, we, we're gonna discuss various things and there might be various things, you know, where there are lots of opinions and we probably uh, uh, not all agree on something, though in that case, I think we're gonna call a vote, okay? So uh, that, we, that we can make decisions and then, and then try to move on. Obviously, the disadvantages, those who are joining us virtually who cannot be here, but I think we're gonna find a way to maybe uh, cast also votes via, 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 via emails or, or, or have a second stage after this meeting before we do anything definitive, you know, uh, uh, ask all of, all of the people who are, want to be involved in this, if that makes sense, okay? Do we have uh, any questions so far? Flavio? Uh, thank you very much for getting us together as a community. That's why science is fun. Uh, I think I missed out on something probably everyone else knows already, but can you briefly tell me why we're not interested in looking at the neurophysiological effect? Why we're going to behavior? In, in some ways, this was an arbitrary decision, uh, and in some ways it was a practical decision. So we, the one thing we wanted to do is something that can be easily done uh, by as many labs as possible, but with, you know, with, with some boundary conditions, right? Uh, and we thought collecting behavioral data in a TACS would be something that could be easily done by many groups and doesn't afford a lot of commitment. I mean, you need to keep in mind here that this is not funded, right? So the way we're gonna do this is, you know, that we're gonna have, uh, we're going to use our unfunded spare time, if you will, to, to collect this data, if that makes sense. It doesn't exclude the possibility, however, for those labs who can and want to, to also collect EEG data. Gregor? Yeah, maybe one, that's an important point, and we discussed that in length, actually. And here, I think, also, want, maybe want to say something about this. Um, so, what did I want to say? <laughs> um, I'm tired. Um, so why not electrophysiology? Um, 
No, I, I lost the, the plot a little bit. Well, I think, I think the way to think about it is basically um, reframing the question. So basically, what, what, what we're actually trying to, to show here, and I think we, we want to show a, a definitely a causal effect, and in ideal case, on change in your activity. And, and the second option would be and on the dependent behavior. However, uh, we thought that it would be probably good to focus on an online effect as to start with um, because of the causality of the interest and therefore with the assumption that there is a technical barrier to achieve a neural recording during, at the moment we start with that, however, uh, there's something for discussion because it could be that uh, we can gain information, for example, looking uh, out of the stimulation bandwidth and so on. But it's, that's basically was where the considerations. But just because I remember, I have to say that nonetheless. <clears throat> yeah, um, if you realize, I mean, we, we explicitly, at the beginning in the question, we had like, can we entrain brain oscillations? No, but we don't really know. I mean, it's technically so challenging. So then we adapted the question. So it, it's sort of like, um, you know, it's going at the, at the very basic, has toxin effect, and how does the effect look like, but not what's the mechanism mm. behind. Mm. So, and that sort of like takes away also the need to record electrophysiology. Yeah. And that if, if it has an effect, then we can go further and try to understand yeah. what, what's the basic. But our goal is, is not to go there, because this is sort of adding a layer of assumptions and complexity that we might not be able to, to tackle in, in a big con uh, consortium. We want to have a big consortium. You, you mentioned something very important, that it's, uh, there are two types of studies, replicating something that has worked in some labs or doing something completely new. I also like the idea of Till Ole Bergman very much, but I can tell you of a number of studies where we thought it was very plausible to try using TACS to modulate behavior and it didn't work mm. for whatever reason. I don't know whether we should really force or convince 40 labs to try something that we don't know whether it works. So I think we, we should discuss this at least some sentences. If maybe somebody would be willing, like Till Ole himself, to, be, uh, to do something like a piloting and there is an indication that it might work in one lab, then it makes much more sense to actually have another 39 labs run Absol into the same absolutely. direction. Absolutely, I, I, I think uh, we, we all agree with you here. However, uh, we are now already discussing the paradigms before they have been presented, so it might be a good idea now to go ahead, present the paradigms, and then uh, discuss the, 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 the paradigms themselves, if, if, if that makes sense. Or does anyone, no, let, let's just do that in the interest of time also. So um, how should we do this? Ole, uh, till Ole. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, I think uh, y y y yours had the highest mean, so I suggest you start, <laughs> then uh, Benedict, and then um, Andreas, uh, student, if that makes sense. So maybe um, to begin with, let me make very clear that uh, I'm just throwing an idea on the market, right? It's true, um, I haven't tested that paradigm, so because my understanding of the challenge was let's, as a community, find a paradigm for which we believe that it would be best suited to test a certain um, assumption, a certain expectation, uh, not to replicate a single finding of which we have a lot, right? So uh, we could try to replicate any one of them. Um, but so I'm, I'm also not going to present um, a paradigm ready to be sent um, as a registered report. Right? So it's, it's an idea, and uh, I want to get your feedback, and we have to discuss it, whether it's worth anything, whether you have experienced maybe um, negative findings using something very similar already. That, that could well be, and um, it might be that after this discussion today, we say, okay, this is not a good way to go, because most likely it's not going uh, to work. Um, so, and yeah, I think we should definitely um, pilot whichever paradigm we decide on, right? Uh, I'm not sure whether it's necessary need to be the person that, is, uh, that had the idea, but it, uh, it could be. So, um, should this, oh yeah, so 
the, the rationale behind um, this, uh, I was just looking at that screen, which is not sure. The rationale is um, if tux, no, say tux, if t ACS at alpha frequency can either entrain endogenous alpha oscillations in the visual cortex, or if it can at least directly impose a rhythmic fluctuation in the visual cortex, um, a rhythmic fluctuation in excitability slash excitation um, at the specific TACS frequency that is used, then um, TACS at alpha frequency should result in a phasic modulation of the neuronal response of visual cortex neurons to sensory input, right, to um, a visual stimulus. And consequently, it should result in a phasic modulation of the perceptual detection rate at the specific TACS frequency. So without making very specific assumptions about whether it's entrainment of an ongoing oscillation or imposing a rhythm, um, we would expect if TACS works, um, it should change cortical excitability in a rhythmic manner, and then we should see a, a rhythmic a phasic effect on um, stimulus processing, which results in uh, different um, uh, perceptual outcomes. So why alpha oscillations? I'm um, just going to present a almost random selection of studies. The body of evidence is much larger, um, but just to give an idea why I came up with alpha oscillations. Um, well, it has been shown that alpha power, for example, is um, predicting the cortical excitability, uh, excitation, the perceptual performance. Um, you know, from or from uh, uh, Vincenzo Romay uh, and Gregor that um, the pre-stimulus alpha power in the visual cortex um, predicts whether or not you perceive a phosphine. Um, we know that uh, pre-stimulus alpha power in the visual cortex predicts the, the chance of um, uh, detecting a, a peripheral um, visual stimulus, um, and that has been shown in, uh, in a number of different studies. But also, importantly, it's not only power, it's also the, the phase, um, which predicts these excitability changes. Um, we know that um, alpha phase modulates gamma oscillations in the visual cortex, also in the ferrotemporal cortex. Uh, we know from primate research that um, um, uh, gamma oscillations are modulated in motor cortex by um, um, the ongoing um, mu alpha rhythm. Uh, we know from monkey research that is, uh, this is between in a number of different regions, also that spiking is modulated phasically by alpha. Uh, Laura de Gea has done an, uh, a very nice study showing that um, the probability to f um, induce a phosphine by TMS of the visual cortex is cycling with the alpha phase of spontaneous alpha. Um, also, the bolt response to a visual stimulus is modulated by alpha phase, shown by Denis Reringer. And um, visual detection, again, of threshold stimuli depends on the, the alpha phase, whether you have a hit or a miss. And for the motor cortex, well, it might be a slightly different animal here. The, um, the, the motor, uh, the sensory motor mu alpha rhythm, but there we have um, shown uh, several times that the, um, the phase um, predicts also the um, amplitude of the motor evoked potential, for example. So in principle, this alpha oscillation family seems to be a, um, a good opportunity because it is a, an oscillation with a high signal to noise ratio that's been studied a lot and has been associated from many different perspectives with um, um, excitability changes, phasic ones. Um, so this might be a good oscillation to target. Now, um, there's also some evidence for uh, entrainability of alpha actually was just thrown together a few slides um, yesterday, so I actually didn't include all those entrainment studies using um, visual stimuli, all those flicker studies that exist, um, but rather focused on the transcranial ones. Um, so, so there's work showing that alpha um, seems to be entrainable by TMS, um, having um, effects on working memory. And then uh, a similar paper, again, from uh, uh, Vincenzo and, uh, and Gregor showing that when stimulating the the visual cortex or the parietal cortex at alpha frequency, uh, this can mimic the effects of alpha um, on um, uh, shifts in spatial attention. Um, there's some electrophysiological evidence even in EEG that um, uh, TMS at alpha frequency seems to entrain 
um, alpha oscillations. And um, we've shown ourselves that there's an alpha response even to a single stimulus, which is modulated by attention in exactly the same way as alpha oscillations are. So we might be able to tap into the same mechanisms. Um, with TACS, we also have some evidence, right, for example, in the auditory cortex, although this has a DC offset, but still it's a, a cyclic, I, I don't know where this comes from. Too close to the microphone. <laughs> Closer. Okay. Um, so there's a phasic modulation of auditory de uh, detection, for example. Um, also, of visual de detection and the sharpening of the ongoing um, oscillation to the um, stimulation um, frequency. And we found in a combined um, TSS imagery that um, the gamma oscillation induced by a visual stimulus is modulated in, in a phasic manner um, for TACS uh, but not, uh, of the occipital cortex, but not a, um, a control stimulation um, that targeted uh, the retina, basically a frontal control stimulation titrated to the same um, um, phosphine threshold. So now, this bunch of, of existing evidence should just uh, um, motivate why I thought alpha would be a good idea. I'm not saying it's the only oscillation we could target, but uh, that might work. So now, um, I, I like this paradigm, so I thought we could actually reuse it, and at least the, the behavioral task has been used before, and um, entrainment, in this case with TMS, has been shown, so it's not completely out of the blue. And um, here, uh, the idea is basically that um, you're, you're fixating on a fixation cross, and then you have two um, placeholders where uh, a periphery threshold target that is individually titrated to um, a perception threshold would pop up on the left or on the right, or not at all. And you would need to respond to, say, whenever you perceive the target on the left or on the right. Um, and in the original study, this was, um, uh, preceded by um, an RTMS burst at theta, alpha, or beta frequency. So in our case, it could be preceded by uh, a few seconds of um, TACS at a certain frequency. Um, and we would apply that, I would um, propose to the visual cortex, um, either at the individual alpha frequency, which requires at least some resting state recording with whatever EG system, I mean, this is pretty simple um, in the beginning. And then um, we could think about whether we want to have some frequency specificity, and then we could also stimulate at um, um, plus minus two hertz, or maybe we could talk about it, should it be three hertz, should it be four hertz. Um, so whether we want to still be on Arnold's tongue and get an, a reduced effect, or whether we should actually be outside of it and get no effect, should discuss it. Um, and as a control stimulation, because you know I'm always advertising active control stimulations, I think it would be good to stimulate another brain region that should not directly entrain visual cortical alpha oscillations. And one possible um, side would be the, the sensory motor cortex. So this is how the, the task design could look like. So the, um, the um, experimental factors uh, would stimulate either the left or the right hemisphere, and I would propose, at least within the same session, having two montages ready, one on the left, one on the right, um, occipital cortex, and present stimuli in the left or right hemifield. Um, so this is more a factor of the task, not of the, of the stimulation, but I showed it here nonetheless. Um, then we would stimulate either occipital cortex or sensory cortex, and if it's the occipital cortex at um, individual alpha frequency, or individual alpha frequency plus or minus two hertz. So what would we expect is um, to get the strongest effect, of course, when we stimulate, let's say, for example, the left occipital cortex to have a phasic modulation of per perception of um, targets in, in the right visual field. So this is why it's marked red here. Uh, we might still expect something um, for plus and minus two hertz if we stay close enough so that, uh, according to Arnold's time, we would still get something or um, actually, if you go further away, or if the stimulation intensity is not sufficient, we would also see nothing over here. In the best case, if the stimulation is, is confined, and I'm going to suggest that we use a, a very a focal montage, 
then we should see no entrainment effect um, when looking at targets in the ipsilateral hemifield. You know, because um, luckily with this uh, overcross processing of official input, while for example, retinal phosphenes that would be induced, or let's say just retinal activation because it doesn't need to produce a, a conscious perception of a phosphine to um, have a neuronal response in the retina and thereby retinothalamocortical effects. Um, so to rule that out, um, one thing might be that using a, a, a focal montage like a, a, a center surround ring electrode um, or this four by one um, um, setups where the current returns pretty much locally and the chances are relatively low that when you stimulate the occipital cortex, you get an effect on the opposite side of the head uh, on the retina. And th the other thing is um, that um, if we still have some retinal effect when stimulating the left side, it would be, if anything, closer to the left eye, um, but it, it should not get a, um, a hemifield effect because uh, left hemifield process in, in the uh, in the right part of, of the right eye and the right part of the left eye. So by having this hemifield specificity, uh, we can also control for potential residual retinal stimulation effects. Um, and then for the sensory motor montage, we would not go through all the different um, frequency control conditions again, right? It doesn't need to be fully crossed. That would uh, produce way too many conditions, and these are quite somewhat already. Um, so we just need to control um, for, for example, these cutaneous effects that you could easily get as well on the somatosensory cortex, but, but there you just should not have a direct effect on um, visual cortex excitability unless you have some uh, cross-modal entrainment. We know that those effects exist as well, but I mean, well, we're t still treating the, the brain, the brain is a network, so that when we stimulate one node and we get a, and we always get an, uh, a network effect, that's a feature of the brain, not a bug. And I think there's no way around that. I mean, whenever we have effective stimulation of one part of the brain, it will spread, right? But this is the best I could come up with. Um, so, yeah, I would advocate to use a, a focal montage, like for example, um, with four by one or those ring electrodes. And um, it would be great if we could support um, those ideas also by modeling work. Right? So we could actually see whether the montage we, we want to use um, is proposedly focal. If the, the currents it would still produce in the, in the eyeballs would be uh, um, low enough so that we wouldn't expect phosphines, at least roughly. So we, we could um, try to um, not just make a hand-wavy montage decision as uh, quite a few times in the past, uh, I did as well, um, but try to really base it on models. And then about the stimulation intensity, well, we could either stick to this one to two milliampere that, that I used a lot of times, right? That's been used in the past a lot. Or actually go for higher intensity, uh, intensities. I know that some people would suggest that, and um, th that's the idea of using topical anesthesia, lidocaine, uh, like this Emla cream, uh, which you could do anyway to further reduce um, the cutaneous sensations below the stimulation electrodes, no matter which stimulation intensity we use. I mean, you can buy it on Amazon, right? It's, it's, uh, you don't even have to go to a pharmacy. It's, it, it, it's no bad stuff. Um, so we might want to consider that as an additional um, control. And, um, oh yeah, so one thing that has often been used to avoid phosphines, at least the offered conscious perception of phosphines, is to t t titrate stimulation intensity to be at 90, 80% phosphine threshold. Usually, this results in simulation intensities that are way below those intensities that have even been shown effective for the motor cortex, so for, for a most ro robust paradigm to change MEP sizes. Um, so while I agree, it is important that we reduce um, the current to below phosphine threshold, maybe you can still try to um, um, just increase this uh, um, threshold for phosphines by using a local montage, for example. Right. Um, so that allows us to use higher um, current intensities. Um, and of course, we could think about, should we use um, just a few seconds of stimulation? I mean, there's a number of paradigms um, that has used uh, 
three seconds, five seconds of, of stimulation and finding effects. Um, I know that in a lot of studies, actually, continuous stimulation is used, uh, usually either with the assumption that it takes a lot of time uh, for the brain to entrain, with no evidence for that, um, or just because of technical limitations and because there was no external control of the simulator. Um, and well, if it should turn out that um, triggering the stimulator by TTL pulse is a technical challenge we cannot overcome in a large enough number of labs, then we might think to go back to some at least blocked fashion of presenting the, the different stimulation frequencies and, and montages, right? Um, but this is maybe something for the practical decisions if you want to go down that road at all. Um, so how could it look like? Um, well, this is our uh, best experimental condition, uh, is stimulating at the correct frequency the, the visual cortex contralateral to the target. So there we should see a modulation of um, the detection accuracy um, by the, the phase angle, uh, while we should not see that in the best case by any other um, control condition. And um, this can be analyzed by looking at the, um, the hits and misses, or calculations something like um, D prime um, for those different phase conditions. And the good thing is um, we don't need to have some fancy synchronization here. We can use a 60 hertz or 100 hertz monitor um, um, and just totally randomly present those visual stimuli, just making sure we're not presenting it at the multiple of the refresh rate. And then we'll have stimuli nicely distributed all over the, um, the cycle of the um, stimulation frequency and can later bin it um, into, what, six, eight, four, I think four at least better six or eight bins, and, and then see whether we get a cyclic modulation. Um, and I think that Benedict also has some ideas about um, how one could uh, get the best um, um, in, in analysis method to, to find those um, basic effects of um, um, behavior. So I'm, um, yeah, th that's so far my two cents. So, um, any comments on, on that directly? Or, or should we first do the, the other paradigm, right? Yeah. And uh, other paradigms, and then discuss it all together? Yeah. Yes, it's better uh, because otherwise we just I get think, lost. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a somewhat, it's up, it's up to, to what you think is most, most feasible. But I, I suggest we first listen to the paradigms, and then we're going to discuss them all. So, uh, Benedict, if you could uh, present yours. And um, yeah. Okay, I have the honor to present the second paradigm. Um, it's very much based on this study here by Roberto Cetri and colleagues, published in 2015. Um, and this paper, in turn, is very much based on an illusion which is called um, sound-induced double flash illusion, which I'm going to show you. So this, yeah, okay. So this illusion was not discovered by Cecere and colleagues. It was first described by Shams and colleagues, 2002. That's not the illusion. <laughs> and that's not the slide. Okay, so unfortunately, I didn't manage to download the illusion to show you, but if you follow this link, not now, I would suggest um, you can have a, a brief look. But it's, it's actually quite easy to explain. So there are several variants of the illusion, but what they did in the Cecere paper was they always presented one flash and two beeps, and the, the flash was always synchronized with the first beep and then the, the key manipulation is the timing of the second beep. So if the 
if the two beeps are very close together, then it's very likely that you perceive two flashes, even though only one flash is presented. If they're far apart, then you perceive only one flash. And you can see that here. So what is shown here is the probability of seeing the illusion as a function of the, the delay between the two beeps. And you see that if they're close together, it's, it's quite likely that you perceive two flashes. And if they are far apart, you don't see two flashes. Um, so what they did in the study is they defined what they call a temporal window of illusion, um, which is the, the window up, the time window up to the inflection point. So uh, within that window, you have a probability of 50% or more to perceive two flashes. And the, the alpha freaks among you might already notice that the, the inflection point is almost exactly 100 milliseconds, which is one cycle of a 10 hertz uh, wave. So it suggests that this illusion is related to alpha oscillations, and indeed it is. So what they did in the study is they defined the individual alpha frequency for each participant based on the, uh, the peak uh, in the spectrum. And what they then did is they correlated the cycle length of each participant with this uh, inflection point, so with the temporal window of the illusion. And indeed, they found a very strong correlation, I think, for, for oscillations. This is a really strong oscillation. And so participants with a relatively short alpha, alpha cycle also have a short temporal window of illusion. So how can we explain this? Uh, I think one possible explanation would be that visual information is processed within, one, uh, within an uh, alpha cycle. And because we, we also have sound, the first beep resets that alpha cycle, so the alpha cycle starts at time zero. And then if the second beep is presented within this alpha cycle, then this beep basically boosts the visual information and creates a second flash. Um, so as we've seen a correlation between alpha cycle length and the visual illusion, it would be uh, an intuitive idea that if we change this alpha, the length of the alpha cycle, we should also change the illusion, right? And that's exactly what, what they tried using TACS. So they, they had three different sessions, so it's a within subject design. In each um, session, they applied TACS at a certain frequency at the individual alpha frequency or slightly above or slightly below, and then they had 40 minutes uh, breaks in between. And what they found is shown here. So they had this electrode configuration. And so they, they found exactly what we would expect based on the hypothesis that the alpha cycle is important for, for the illusion. So if we, if we stimulate um, at a faster frequency so that the alpha cycle is shorter, then we also decrease the temporal window of the illusion. If we stimulate at a slower frequency, then we can increase uh, the temporal window of the illusion. So that's the idea. Um, obviously, I don't want to convince you to run this paradigm. It's more important that we find the right paradigm. So I'll try to honestly discuss uh, points that we need to clarify. So. Um, one thing I like about this paradigm is that it's focused on the frequency of the oscillations, not on power. Um, Flavio my talk, uh, can talk two hours about this, or two days with 600 slides. So, um, so I think if we have two oscillators, one external and one internal, and they, have, they differ in their frequency, then what we would expect is that the internal oscillation is drawn towards the frequency of the, of the uh, external oscillator, and that's part of the definition of uh, entrainment, if we want. But we don't necessarily ex uh, expect a change in power. Um, also, um, oscillations are a phenomenon that's really defined in time, right? So I like this paradigm because it's also, it uses task that is, uh, has a very temporal nature. Um, also, it's a within subject analysis, so it has relatively high statistical power. Um, the assumption that it makes is that the alpha is important for perception and the alpha cycle is related to 
uh, a window of temporal integration or a window, window of temporal resolution. Um, as Ole Till, <laughs> Till has also shown in his slides. Um, I think there's lots of evidence for this. So I think um, if, we, if we don't find an effect here, then we can be relatively sure that it's not because alpha is not linked to behavior. It's more that we cannot change alpha oscillations, but we can discuss this. Um, so obviously, it would be interesting to, to hear how many of you have tried to do this and failed. But that's the case for all paradigms that we propose. OK, um, so what they didn't do in the Chechere study is they they basically ignored the phase relation between um, the presented stimuli and the, and the tax or TSES. They, they simply uh, applied tax and then they, I think, randomly presented the stimuli and then analyzed the data. So this is something we also need to discuss. It's, it's related to Till's proposal. Um, the question, can we explain the results using peripheral stimulation? Um, I think it's theoretically possible, but um, in this case, we need to assume that the frequency of stimulation is correlated with phosphine perception or other processes, and these processes then have to be correlated with the illusion, so it can be explained, but it's relatively difficult to explain it with this. Um, and I also have some ideas what we could do as a control. For instance, I don't think there's a difference uh, concerning phosphine perception between 10 and 20 hertz. Uh, however, we wouldn't expect an effect uh, if we stimulate with 20 hertz if it's explained using oscillations. So you might try that. Uh, also, we could try different montages with, which have been shown to induce phosphines but not necessarily alpha power, uh, alpha oscillations. Okay, that's the final point and I think that's a point that needs to be discussed uh, like after we present the paradigm. Um, I think we, we need to agree if we really want to show that we use TSES to entrain oscillations, because um, I think almost all of the paradigms can be explained by other mechanisms than entrainment. For instance, um, the results here in the Cheshire study, they can be explained by differences in alpha power at different frequencies. And I, I think it so it has been shown many times that if we apply TSES, then we find changes in alpha power. Um, but they don't necessarily have to be correlated with entrainment. They can be produced by other mechanisms. So one thing we could do is we, we could interrupt the stimulation from time to time, then measure, uh, use EEG, for instance, to measure oscillations and see if these oscillations are face-locked face with the TSES. That, that we omitted, basically. But that's just an idea we, that we can discuss. OK, I think that's it. Yep. Um, so um, we, we're going to have the last presentation of the paradigms. Um, to all those of you listening in from the internet, I just want to say I have created a Gmail account it's tacschallenge at gmail.com. I will uh, uh, write it on the screen after this presentation. Uh, and so uh, if you have any comments and want to contribute to the discussions, please do write the comments to this uh, email account. OK. Hi. All right, so I'm a, Is it closer? All right. Um, I'm a PhD student with Andrea Antal. As has been said before, my name is Albert Lehr. And I'm going to present the suggestion, um, which is based on a paper from our group, which was published two years ago. The paper is called Spatial Working Memory in Humans Depends on Theta and High Gamma Synchronization in the Prefrontal Cortex. So it's already been published and um, has never been replicated. I don't know if it has been tried. And I'm going to take you through it. The task which was employed in the paper is a two-bag visual spatial match-to-sample task in which a certain combination of dots was shown on the grid. And um, then in a probe, one dot was shown, and the participants had to answer if the um, probing dot was at the same position as one of the dots of the um, sample. And this engaged their visual, spatial, or their spatial working memory. 
the, um, there were 80 trials and it took nine minutes to perform the task. Then now we come to the um, stimulation paradigm, which is rather complex. So first of all, there were four sessions during the experiment and one is obviously sham, one is six hertz stimulation and then the two last conditions are six hertz stimulation with 80 hertz stimulation um, superimposed on it once in the first condition during the peak of the six hertz stimulation and once during the trough of the six hertz stimulation. And um, this was to simulate um, cross frequency coupling and um, yeah, on the right side we can see the um, estimated electric field sizes and um, the main electrode was, there were five electrodes, the main electrode was positioned over the AF3 position of the ten, 10 system and the four elect return electrodes were um, t six centimeters away from the main electrode. All right, then there are two types of um, outcome um, so that were measured behaviorally the um, sensitivity index for the working memory performance, which is calculated from the hit rate and the false alarm rate. And there you can see, I don't have a pointer yet, um, that the, in blue, stimulating with just six hertz, increased the sensitivity um, of the performance of the participants. If then, on, with an effect size of 0.2, roughly, and if then 80 hertz, so theta, um, high gamma was superimposed on the theta um, stimulation, um, it changed. If it was superimposed in the trough, the performance dropped and was non-significantly different from sham. If it was superimposed on the peak, it actually increased still to um, be significantly different, different from sham, but also from the six hertz stimulation with an effect size of 0.5. Now, in the paper, there was also EG analysis being done, which I don't know if like now the discussion seems to be going that um, it would be, um, some say it would be better to have EG analysis. Some would say that just behavior is easier to perform in a lot of labs. What has been done is that um, the weighted face leg index was calculated between the, um, between electrode pairs and um, from this, the connectivity index was calculated as the proportion of sensor pairs that had a significant increase in weighted face leg index um, divided by the number of total sensor pairs. What we see again is that the six hertz stimulation without superimposing theta um, increases this global um, phase index or this uh, global phase connectivity and um, it's even more increased if, a, um, if an 80 hertz wave is superimposed on the peak of the six hertz stimulation but if it's uh, imposed on the trough of the six hertz stimulation, then it drops back to the same, um, to be as high as doing SHEM or doing the control. All right, so we have behavioral readouts and the neurophysiological readouts. Then for the tax challenge, we um, would need four sessions. One is a training session, which was also in the paper. And um, then a SHEM stimulation, stimulation with a single frequency of six hertz and a cross frequency of six hertz and 80 superimposed on the peak, which obviously needs, uh, would mean that we had four sessions per participant, so quite some work. But um, as the six hertz stimulation and the six hertz stimulation with 80 in the peak were the ones being effective and having an effect, these are the ones we would suggest. And the sensitivity index is obviously the outcome variable we expect to see changed. The reaction times were not changed in the paper, we don't expect any change there. And then the EG analysis is matter to debate, could also be dropped, obviously. And, um, but for this pre and post stimulation, um, so like stimulation was done during the task, EG was measured in resting state before and after the task, didn't say that. And then the connectivity index would be the readout there. All right. Um, some things which are still to mention is that a multi-channel stimulator would be needed for the five electrode setup. And also, it's obviously important that the stimulator is able to um, work with a complicated waveform which has to be put in by um, somehow do, um, like plotting it on, on MATLAB or something and then transferring it to the stimulator. If the stimulator can't do it, nobody can measure the experiment. Ten groups said yes, yes, they can do it. They also have the EG to measure it. One said they ca cannot do it at all. 
And um, obviously, we could also measure just on one side, we can stimulate with one frequency, and, um, but also with the cross-frequency coupling. Um, so we could test in like a um, higher, uh, like a, or a function which is even like more complex than, than just stimulating with one um, frequency. And also we could test the higher cognitive function of um, spatial working memory. But the negative side is the complicated waveform, as I just mentioned. And um, entrainment, there was one critique in the voting process already that entrainment is not so easily um, inferred from this. Also in the EEG measurement, there's no um, proof of entrainment. And if this is the goal, then it might be something else to um, different thing might be better to do. But yeah, I'm just putting it here for discussion. And EEG obviously put some arbitrariness in the measurement and in the pre-processing maybe. All right, that's just a summary. So yeah, I hope to put it for discussion and let's see what happens. All right, thanks. All right, so thanks for everyone presenting their paradigms. I think we have an interesting mix of uh, paradigms, like one lab presenting the paradigm of another lab, one lab presenting their own paradigm and the new paradigm. So that should be, should be interesting. So I'm going to open the floor for discussions now. Um, so if you have any comments, now is your time. Oh, yeah. So could, could we get the screen back? Because um, I'm going to. Yeah. So for all those who are streaming, I've we've just set up a Gmail account, which will be displayed shortly, the email address. Hopefully. Um, and so this email account will be monitored by a volunteer uh, today, but more importantly, tomorrow. Uh, and anyone who has comments, they should write an email to this email account and then they can feed into the this discussion. So that's, that's the email account tax challenge. Um, and Did I? Oh. <laughs> okay, there is a typo. I just sent myself an email from that, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna confirm. Yes, that is the correct email. So, um, all right. So, any comments? Good. <laughs> are you are you monitoring it? Okay. <laughs> I think there will be many com comments and I just started off now here. Um, so one thing which was dis not discussed at all is, uh, because it's not so central um, for planning the experiment, is, is statistics. Um, the statistical analysis, I think, um, was a little bit, what was presented there was, uh, can we prove an effect basically, or what happens when we don't see an effect? And I think we might want to consider going to a Bayesian um, approach that we can really show the evidence for an absence of an effect right. Right. also. Um, I'm not the expert on that, but I think that's what would really, uh, really improve also the, our interpretation of the outcome because maybe, maybe we end up in a nowhere else yeah. land that we can, cannot really say, well, we have an effect, but we're also not yeah. sure that, that, that we don't have an effect. This is probably just relatively simple to do. We just have to remember that. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're making a very good point. Probably I should say, um, so we, we've, we have um, noted several points for discussions tomorrow, mm -hmm. and indeed statistical procedures, how we go about statistics is uh, one of them. Yeah. So um, hopefully for tomorrow, um, I mean, I could just walk you through what we planned for tomorrow so that you know uh, what, 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 what should we discuss for tomorrow. It's, uh, um, many possible things. So these are the points that we thought about, right? So the design, stimulation parameters, measurement outcomes, confounds to exclude control conditions, the minimal number of participants required, the required equipment, um, 
we also had how we're going to implement it, right? Pilot studies in small labs, if we have a new paradigm before we go ahead. Uh, if we're considering pilot studies, what are the criteria to scale up to the whole group? Uh, if criteria are not reached, do we consider an iterative process where we optimize design? This is, of course, if we go for a new design. Um, do we want to have single multi-center studies versus multiple single uh, studies? If the group size allows, do we have a multiple single studies? Uh, uh, so we could have multiple single studies set up uh, to split multiple associated questions uh, and so on. And we also thought for tomorrow, we're going to have specific points that we could actually split up in groups, right? So we could have a group that is interested in the statistical concerns, and then so we have a group that discusses that in particular, and then we have other groups uh, who are uh, considered each with, with one of these things which might increase the likelihood that we actually have something productive coming out so that we don't try to tackle you know, this beast in one go, but split it up and, and tackle each, each, each point specifically. However, I think what we should discuss now is in particular the paradigms that are presented and try to get the feel whether there is a, a paradigm that, you know, that, 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 that we feel most comfortable to go ahead with as a group or whether we think we should look for new paradigms. So I would like you to think in particular of those paradigms and not necessarily anticipate all the nitty gritty questions which we're going to address tomorrow if, if, if that is possible at all. Yeah. Um, concerning the paradigms, I'd like to make um, just the point that at the moment it was a little bit presented either or, like either we go for something which is existing or we come up with something new. And obviously the new might be more fancy or sexy uh, from a uh, from new scientific inside point of view, but it comes also at a higher risk. The old one might have the, the problem that maybe it's not perfectly done. Um, so uh, uh, um, in a between way would be to start from an old one and just systematically re uh, re review it to, to come up with an even stronger um, implementation of that. Um, which would mean that we would still probably need a pilot phase pr probably, but it's at, at a reduced risk and could probably be run in a shorter pay, uh, pay or shorter or a quicker pace. Uh, just to, to also um, point out to this, this opportunity. Yeah, um, I think it is a good idea maybe going for something mixed <clears throat> and looking at Till's presentation and one of the slide, I realized that obviously one of like Christoph's design were sort of figuring in a figure, in a graph. And this is Helfrich paper, 2004, current biology, which has a bipolar um, OZ, uh, CZ montage, where there's a central visual, visual stimulus. Is that right? Oh, there's central visual stimulus, and then there's a phase dependency, um, basically. I mean, this could be like sort of a reproduction before we go um, further with Tails design, if we think that's an interesting um, way to go, just like this. hasn't been presented, but that seems something that, or this is something that is published, um, where um, phasic modulations have been reported. We know the effect size, um, so we could build on that, like as an, as an example. So, I think it's um, actually an interesting idea that may maybe also for a, um, an early piloting phase, start from something more simple. But I uh, acknowledge that I suggested also quite some conditions, although I hope, well, maybe depending on the length of the session, it could be actually um, uh, within subject, within single session study, right? <coughs> um, but so the question would be if we would go for, um, for example, this um, Helfrich study as, as a replication first, should we do then? use exactly the same parameters, the same montage, the same stimulation intensities, and so forth, or already start and um, modulate it a bit. Like, for example, we could start with a local, or, or, or more local montage um, to have um, a, st a stronger case against phosphines, for example, and be able to use higher stimulation intensities, so increasing our chances maybe to see something, um, uh, but still use a uh, a central stimulus and not the hemispheric montage, uh, the beauty of which is um, also in internal control, right? Um, 
but maybe as a first step one could lose the, the hemispheric specificity. So if we don't have the hemispheric specificity, how do we control for transcutaneous effects? Well, we, we could still use the, um, the smaller sensory control montage that's in there as well. Okay. We, we could even still uh, we could st stick to one uh, hemisphere and um, through the paradigm just uh, unilaterally, <laughs> it would also be possible, or move the electrode to the the center, um, to the midline, okay. and go for a, a central presentation. Um, but I, I would, yeah, I would still insist on at least having a, a control for uh, for Sweden's and, and cutaneous uh, stimulation effects. Um, one could say, okay, this is something we could do in a, in a second attempt after we replicate the main effect and then do a control experiment to, to control for it. But I think it, it's nice if you can uh, maybe even do that in, in one session in the same subjects would be less effort and a lot of stronger conclusions eventually after collecting the data okay. if you um, really okay. collect that at once. Okay. Mia, if you have a question, just raise your arm. I will look around and then I will, you know, mentally log you into a log. And also, of course, the junior people are encouraged to comment, okay? So this is a comment on the question. So I think on the uh, one on the high level, I will uh, definitely strongly recommend that we have an iterative approach rather than an op in which we're piloting and optimizing the paradigms um, before we go to a large scale study. I also suggest considering doing that in parallel and more of one, more than one paradigms. Um, if you do it in a, in a subset of lab, that can be done in parallel. Uh, the important bit there would be to uh, de well define the criteria of how we, what we want to optimize and how we make the selection. So that's, that's in general. I think on, on specific on the paradigms, uh, f uh, if I just give some comments. So I think what I like in the first uh, paradigm, uh, as I see the strengths of that, is that there is a very, very strong uh, evidence for uh, both uh, correlation and causal, uh, essentially, effect of the oscillation in the uh, behavior that we are testing. I think the second strength of that is that the behavior we are testing is a low level. We are looking at perception and not a higher level cognition, which I think is an advantage uh, at this stage. And I think what I like there as well is the fact that we, in a sense, uh, between hemisphere, can look at an effect of changing, change in alpha power, so if we change, increase the alpha power, we may see a different uh, in detection rate between the hemispheres or between sides. Uh, and then within the hemisphere or within the test, the stimulated hemisphere, we look on the effects on phase. So we get these two uh, potentially measurement outcome in the same uh, study. I think the, the, um, the, the disadvantages or the cons that I see or the, maybe the, the, um, the challenges is that there is uh, essentially um, an on-task on effect that we have to take in consideration. So the, the, the power of alpha will drift and therefore we, uh, we may need to account for that and therefore one suggestion would be to uh, add some kind of a baseline uh, before each uh, block, so without stimulation. So if you have a block design and you have a non-stimulated period of whatever, one minute and so on, where you have your baseline essentially uh, detection rate and then you can normalize everything to that and account for the on-task effect. I just suggest uh, Regarding the second paradigm, I think it's the same pro, uh, thing, uh, uh, strengths that is looking at essentially at the low level perception. Um, and the second advantage of that uh, strength is that it's looking on a very, it's supposedly very uh, frequency sensitive but this I, I see as well as a disadvantage because we all know that the alpha, individual alpha is not a single peak. It's, it's a broad range of frequencies and essentially we are looking for a very small change in this peak and we know that it's fluctuating. So I, I see a risk in that sense that we, the effect will be smaller in kind of a natural fluctuation of the brain. And, um, and I think the other point I had about that, that um, 
that the, if we, although it's a public, uh, published study, uh, the, the study was not, uh, test, did not test for confounding effect of uh, extraneous sensory stimulation during the, from the electrical stimulation, meaning force fins and tingling, that, that, and therefore I think the level of evidence of that exists is still uh, needs to be uh, well uh, or systematically tested. Um, so I think the the other the other one the, the other disadvantage that uh, we don't know um, if the effect the behavior effect that we are testing in the second paradigm is sensitive to the alpha power. So in a sense, uh, it would be nice if we were able to kind of capture both of them as the first paradigm. Regarding the third paradigm, I think the what I why I personally like there is the use of the nested uh, gamma theta stimulation that uh, we know works well in, with TMS, uh, or the, the nested theta type of um, a stimulation. Um, I think the, the, the cons is going into uh, higher level cognition, in this case memory, uh, compared to perception. Okay, we had uh, Benedict. Um, just quickly concerning uh, your point near that the first, in the first paradigm, we have, if it works, we have strong evidence that oscillations are costly, relevant for perception. Um, I wonder if we need a, another control for that, because what I, so I assume that we apply TCS and the current fluctuates between minus one and one milliamp, and we find that perception varies between 40 and 60 percent detection probability. Um, I wonder if it if we need to check if it's not possible that if we apply minus one milliamp, so TDCS, without any phasic changes, if that would not also result in 40% detection probability and the application of one milliamp in 60%. So is, is, are these phasic changes really relevant? Or could we get the same result uh, using TDCS? I think we discussed this already yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, and true, we discussed that yesterday over drinks already. <laughs> and and uh, I think my take on it is that um, if it turns out that if you produce um, the same voltages tonically with TDCS, anodally or cathodically, and you get the same increases or decreases in, in perception rate, this is not an argument against um, an, an entrainment of oscillations or an entrainment of um, neuronal um, excitability with the, uh, with the TSS approach. Uh, but rather speaks towards the mechanisms behind it, namely that um, the oscillatory or, or that the phasic effect of an oscillation on any kind of measurement of excitability or, or on behavior could be just explained by the voltage level right, in the brain. So um, it's one possible mechanism that um, what an oscillation does is eventually by which mechanism soever it is generated, it is causing excitability fluctuations of the neurons. And um, why shouldn't it have the same effect as constantly moving a threshold, yeah. right? Yeah. I, uh, as a point to note here, I think uh, TDCS, it's fairly well accepted that with TDCS, you shift the neurons closer to a firing threshold and shift it away as it has been shown with TMS. Now, the, in TSCS, we don't have such a demonstration that is agreed upon on the field, right? I mean, this is the very reason that we sit here together. So I guess if we manage to get something that, you know, proves that TSCS does indeed shift, you know, uh, this excitability threshold rhythmically around, then we're in business and then we can, yeah. you know, care about, okay, how does it interact with oscillations and yada, 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 right? But uh, we are not at this point yet. So getting there is what we try to achieve here. Yeah. I agree. Um, yeah, I also wanted to say something about comparing the three paradigms, and maybe I just paraphrase what has been said. Um, so I'm thinking about the three paradigms, how many assumptions do you need um, so that your sort of um, hypothesis um, can be fulfilled, or you, you get the expected effects. And I think um, the, the least assumptions in the paradigm of Dill and the more we go further, the more assumptions there are. So in Benedict's paradigm, the assumption 
is that um, you know there is a brain oscillation, and we can we can entrain that brain oscillation, and this brain oscillation has something to do with this um, illusion. So there's already three assumptions. So if any of these assumptions are wrong, then we wouldn't find anything. Um, and so there's a lot of risk not finding anything. And if you f don't find anything, you have to say, well, possibly TACS works, but our assumption was wrong. Mm. And if you go to the next paradigm, which is like um, cross-frequency, I think there's even more assumptions. And then again, if you don't find anything, we can't really say much about TACS, what we want to do. Well, that's, that's our goal. And I think in the first paradigm, there's actually not an assumption about brain oscillations. I mean, brain oscillation could play a role, we might pick it up, but even if brain oscillation don't play a role, we still have a chance to find a phatic relationship, yeah. exactly because of um, what Taylor just said. So that's why, personally, I like the first paradigm most, because it has the least assumptions. Yeah. Absolutely, so whatever paradigm we agree upon, it will come with a set of assumptions. The more people are happy to buy in, in those set of assumptions, you know, the better, and obviously the, less is the, the, the least assumptions we could make, the higher the likelihood we're gonna get a lot of people. But just to play devil's advocate here, um, because it has been uh, uh, presented as an advantage that, we, that the paradigm is very simple and targets a very simple neural process. So I would like to argue against that, saying that um, we all could agree on, on the notion that oscillations are about networks, right? And uh, communication between networks and obviously the more complex process like working memory, just to argue here for the uh, theta gamma coupling, uh, requires obviously that interaction in the network. So it could be <laughs> that if the mechanism of TSCS is to entrain a naturally occurring oscillating, that they actually have more chance of finding it with a more complex paradigm that relies on these network interactions as opposed to a very simple paradigm that might rely less on these oscillations, just to you know, be devil's advocate here. Christoph? And let me please encourage the junior people to also make comments, okay? So you will be the guys who in the end of the day might actually run the uh, paradigm in the lab. So, you know, use your voice here. Already when I read the paradigms, I really liked uh, Till Ole's paradigm a lot because it's along the lines that we think. But I think there are a couple of things that are critical about uh, the paradigm. Some of the evidence that you uh, used that sounds so plausible comes from very different experiments. So for example, the Matthewson paradigms, uh, they had a visual flicker before they presented the task, and the phase that was shown there as phase dependency was the phase of an assumed oscillation that outlasts the end of the steady state flicker. A very flicker that you showed was the oscillation before a target was presented. So th th they come from very different data sets, and Yes, I also think or hope that this would work, but this is something that we should keep in mind. It's, it's uh, more vague uh, than it seems when you present it. And it takes a lot of sophistication to carry out this uh, paradigm because it requires that the TACS wave and the presentation on the monitor or LED or whatever you use is synchronized, right? You it doesn't? But didn't you want to show a phase dependency? Yeah, but uh, we can do postdoc trial sorting. So it's um, uh, well, yeah, uh, that's a requirement. So we, we would need to record the TACS signal. So, but um, we should do that anyway, because otherwise we don't know the phase, right? So either the output of the stimulator that's provided, or with two simple EG electrodes put next to the stimulation electrodes by any kind of um, cheap amplifier, just to to know the phase at the time of stimulation. That's, of course, crucial if you want to look at a phasic effect in general, so we can't get around that. Um, and then we, we lose all the problems with the um, synchronization, because we can use uh, any monitor, even, well, it might be 66 hertz, might be 80, might be 100 hertz, refresh rate in different labs. Uh, we just have to make sure it, it is not synchronized to the stimulation onset, and then we get a nice um, coverage across trials of all the different phase angles, which we can later bin arbitrarily to a number of, of phase bins. So I, uh, I thought thereby uh, um, the, the technical ch uh, 
uh, demands would be reduced. But of course, um, I, th I think what's uh, more of a technical challenge is that um, we would need, in the best case, within one session, have four different uh, local montages on the head. And if the lab only has one stimulator, um, we would need to have something to quickly um, connect it to uh, um, uh, one or the other montage to, to the stimulator. I'm sure that there's a simple technical solution for that. Just need to build. <laughs> If you don't synchronize them beforehand, then you have to record that they were synchronized. So you need a monitor, you need an EEG, and then you have to uh, monitor the EEG, or the TACS with the EEG, and you have to have some photodiode on the, yeah. But he said he wants to keep it simple, and therefore he doesn't want EEG, so 40 labs can participate. Okay, I see. No, um, so I'm, uh, well, throughout the entire process, I was always strongly, um, uh, stressing that we should go for quality first and then for quantity in terms of um, participating labs. So w we need, a, yeah, we need a um, certain technical standard that um, can be fulfilled. And um, so I think it, it doesn't help if 100 labs do the same thing if it's flawed, right? Uh, so um, I, I think it's, it's relatively easy to um, program something in MATLAB or whatever that anyone uh, can use. Uh, uh, that provides a, um, a marker, right? writes a marker into this one channel EG that we use to record the, the TACS artifact and um, the, the time points of the um, stimuli. I mean, um, this really works with any garage built EG system. It's relatively simple. I think that the, the challenge uh, or the reason why we um, at some point decided not to go for um, a new physiological outcome, EEG, MEG or something, is rather that while a, a, a lot of us tried, including you and me, to do it concurrently, um, it is um, an extra challenge getting rid of the artifacts, evaluating the, um, the neural activity, so the, uh, the voltages at the time um, of, of stimulation at the um, frequency of the stimulation. And um, there's really an ongoing debate whether that's possible or to what degree it's possible and reliable and robust. So I think this is the main reason why we said, okay, for the first um, challenge, we stick to behavior. Um, but I know that there's already a, a subgroup of people strongly interested in taking it further and actually doing the concurrent um, neurophysiological measurements. Uh, near, for example, I'm also totally up for that. So we, um, we're going to, to take it further. Yeah. But Maybe in the second go. But I would, uh, I would, I would try to um, focus it on, you know, this being the first attempt of this, and it will be a process. And if we're gonna make it more sophisticated and then have less labs doing, you know, follow-up studies, then that's fine. But I think we need to take into account that there will be a trade-off in the end in terms of technical sophistication and the number of labs participating. And we need to find a good trade-off because otherwise, you know, if we only have two labs, it's not really a multi-center study, is it? So Flavio first, then Axel. And I think at some time we're gonna, Carlo, for how long do we have the room? When do we have to leave for dinner? Carlo, hello. So uh, for how long can we go on discussing this? <coughs> you have to close now. Five minutes. Okay, I'm, so we <laughs> I'm gonna be atypically fast. <laughs> so um, uh, just a few like big picture points. It seems like the discussion, we're really discussing two different things, right? One is technical feasibility, and the other one is scientific premise. And uh, maybe I would encourage the leadership to kind of have these two separate discussions, because I think mixing them together might uh, be not that clear. Uh, next thought is, I'm unaware of any TACS study which has been replicated independently. And I start to develop the sense that this should be probably the first step. Uh, Third comment, uh, and this is coming a little bit more from the clinical trials side, where um, uh, multi-site studies are very, um, very common, and I'm not sure how many groups have been involved in multi-site studies before, but if I do the calculation in my head how much this costs, 
uh, what we're discussing here, we're at the high single digit million dollar number. And um, so I understand it's like crowd, so crowdfunding, we all put a little bit of something in, but I'm, I'm starting to feel for this scale of effort, we should have the funding agencies here and we should come up with something where we're not guerrilla style or trying to fight this one paper and that one obnoxious sentence at the end of the paper, but really have an, a, a very different uh, structure of how we go about this because I'm, I'm concerned about how many resources will get absorbed by this, and I hear risk, 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 and I think it's, they're also, you know, you encourage the young people to speak up, and I think maybe they haven't spoken up mm. because they're scared, because, uh, <laughs> I'll stop here. Okay, can I, ch can I just comment, comment on this? I mean, I, I think one comment I would like to make is regarding the funding and regarding the, the resources we're gonna throw at this, and the question basically, is it worth it? I think what we're doing at the moment is, every one of us is doing their own, probably hopelessly underpowered TACS study in the labs anyway, with a bunch of master students, grad students, and so on and so forth. So we're gonna wasting this money <laughs> at the moment as we go, anyways, right? So we might as well waste it on a good cause, is what I'm saying. Um, a comment on the technicalities or like the technical challenges. I mean, there will be probably a, a pilot phase. Uh, and uh, this time can be well used to, to develop hardware um, for, for uh, specific purposes, like recording the TACS trace. This doesn't need an EG amplifier, you can buy an Arduino. So, uh, and this could be rolled out in a standardized fashion with, with, the, uh, with the software to all labs participating. So um, this, this technical hurdle really doesn't have to be a less technical hurdle. It's any more efficient than in the second stage because then not every lab has to implement this recording of, of, of events and TACS at the same time. Uh, it's just standardized uh, software hardware which is used for that. Um, and maybe that needs a little bit of funding or resources, but I think it's manageable. It's fantastic that we have engineers like you guys here who actually solve problems. <laughs> uh, we have probably, a, oh, there's one comment from, from, from Mircea back there, who is a PhD student. If, uh, it's probably going to be, be the last comment before we have to close this, before Carlo kicks us out. Hey, yes, sorry, um, it's just, well, uh, actually it goes against <laughs> Flavio's uh, thing with the whole resources, but my, if we're going to make it an iterative process anyway, and there's such a discussion about the paradigms, wouldn't it, and we, we want to pilot anyway, regardless of the paradigm, wouldn't it be an idea to pilot both paradigms in different centers, in just on a small scale, and then see which looked better if we're gonna pilot so much anyway, but then of course we need more resources, so it's just a idea I was uh, having. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I guess, uh, I mean, if we're gonna, th that's a possibility indeed. If, we, if, if there is no clear preference for a paradigm, we're gonna say, okay, it's either or, then we can pitch the paradigms, depending on the number of labs who are willing to pilot it against each other and see which one yields uh, robust results. I guess, um, at this point, what I want to say is, you know, this should be a stimulation for discussions over dinner, which I'm sure uh, we will have. We're going to continue this discussion tomorrow. Anyone who's tuning in from the web, you know, you can email to this so you can feed in. And uh, so we're going to pick up uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much.